love working to Sadie Dean. <laughs> yeah. Did you everybody hear that? I love working with Sadie Dean. Sadie Dean, how are you today? I'm great. I'm really good. It's hot in LA now. We had a cold okay. weekend and now it's hot. Um, like what's hot? I don't know. It feels like a hundred degrees out there, but I'm exaggerating. Um, actually I'll tell you something funny just to show you like where my brain has been. It says it's 81. That's hot. That's hot. It's supposed mm -hmm. to rain in Palo on Friday. Um, so for the past like two months, I don't drive a lot because I get to work from home and I don't really need to go anywhere. But when I do drive, uh, it's still hot in LA. And one day I was like, oh my God, my AC is not working. And I'm like, this sucks. Like, that's just like the one thing I don't like, it just car expenses just always like, they're always more than you want them to be. Yes. And, and my car is at least 10 years old. And so I'm like, all right, well, I guess I won't drive my car as much. Like I'll let Rob do most of the driving because he has the newer car and AC and uh, a couple of weeks ago, we took some friends to a, a barbecue and I was like, I'm sorry, my AC is not working. We'll just like roll down the windows and like, I'm so, and it's like Old really school. hot. Yeah. And uh, so today I, um, I ordered, I ordered some gear and somehow it got sent to my parents' house. I got a note from my mom, like, did you, are you expecting anything at our house? Like, no. Why would why would I send things like packages for myself? Anyways, it turns out like my old like account is still associated with their mm -hmm. home address. Um, so I was like, great, like I have to go drive over there. It's hot today. My AC is not working. So then I'm like leaving this afternoon and it's really hot. And I'm like hitting the dashboard, trying to like hope that the AC would kick on. I'm hitting every dial. And then I realized that <laughs> this whole time my dial has been set to the defrost setting <laughs> turned it over and there was like ac look how much money you saved yeah yeah so for two okay. months no that AC. that's crazy that's yeah. crazy so i have the next time it gets cold in la um or even hot there's a, there's a weather app called what the forecast, like mm -hmm. WT forecast. And like, right now, this is what it says for anyone on YouTube. You can see it. It says, it says partly cloudy, cold nights are fucking bullshit. <laughs> it has the best like sassy <laughs> forecast. So it probably would have a, had a lot to say in your car with no AC when it was yeah. feeling how hot it was. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you need to look at that app and then listen to David Lynch's uh, daily forecast that he does on YouTube. Oh, he does a daily forecast? Yeah. Video and all. It's amazing. Oh my God. I got to watch that. Yeah. He used uh, to do it at a radio show that they got rid of the actual radio station, but that was like the thing to look forward to. Does anybody listen to radio anymore? They're too busy listening to Reckless Creative's podcast. Right. Who needs radio? Good radio. Everyone. I know. Radio's I just got some Sono speakers for our antique shop and I set them up this morning and I'm going to, when I go down there this weekend to organize stuff and move ghosty things around because there are ghosts there. Um, I'm going to turn on a Reckless Creative's podcast and listen to it and see how we sound they're like this is terrible <laughs> I just say, the ghosts are going to retaliate every day <laughs> whose bright idea was it to let these two have a podcast because I'm starting to wonder <laughs> <laughs> me too I know it's just so um so the other day we recorded the podcast. So we're just recording a little intro here today, but um, we had Zach Ford on, right? He's got a great, great story. You're gonna love this. 
Yeah, Zach, uh, I he came to me through Script Magazine. Actually, like I, I want to say, like the first week I started at Script, um, he's like they're like a miracle. And uh, he, the first article he wrote for us was called uh, "How I Hijacked Hollywood" or "How I Sold a Screenplay," and it's basically like his tale of hijacking Hollywood in the most creative way, most reckless way possible. And it's one of my favorite articles on scripts. Um, and besides that, all of mine, yeah. <laughs> besides, obviously, obviously, there's Jeannie and then there's Zach, but um, Zach's article is great. We're going to link to it in the show notes because highly, highly recommend it. It's actually a two-parter. Um, it's really good. Yeah. And uh, his movie that he talks about in there, Watcher, um, you get to kind of see the journey from him selling it as a spec to it now hitting the big screen pretty soon. It, it premiered at Sundance. It's showing at South by Southwest, which I'll see at the there at the conference and um, the festival and on the big screen with him and hopefully his, his parents. Uh, I'm really excited. But yeah, it's a really cool story and it, journey and I think it's you know something that's super inspiring for all these writers trying to make this make this Hollywood dream happen and wait till you guys hear how many screenplays this dude has written and when he started you are gonna feel like a total <laughs> slacker yeah yeah hopefully it'll inspire you to like start puffing out stuff and maybe do what he did or don't I don't know it's interesting. It's fun. It is. He's really cool. So you guys are really going to love it. So let's just get at it. Or do you want to play a game? Let's do it. Um, so Zach, can I just say, I read the two articles that you wrote for Script Magazine and Sadie, I hate you because... <laughs> I want that content for pipeline artists because <laughs> that was so good. So thank you. A little editor jealousy here. Yeah. Yeah. I lucked out. That was like one of my first ones, like right when I started. Yeah. I remember emailing you that week back in 2021 in February or January. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Should we just get the, the most important thing out of the way? Can we talk about how you ran for mayor of Scanny Analysts? <laughs> that says nothing to do with filmmaking, but it's I, reckless. it's <laughs> totally reckless. And I'm also fascinated with what, what people do outside of their creative mm -hmm. um, lane. Sure. Uh, and I you got arrested? I didn't get arrested. Not this time. Okay. Um, I've been arrested before. Uh, I <laughs> thought I was going to get arrested this time, but uh, the American Civil Liberties Union kept the uh, administration, uh, the local government in Skinny Atlas and the local police force from arresting me. Uh, the full story is, uh, yeah, I ran for mayor in my hometown in Skinny Atlas, which is in upstate New York. And uh, I was living in New York City for 16 years and realized that uh, if I move back to my hometown for a couple of years, I could get my writing done um, in the local library uh, and I could uh, run for mayor. I, I kind of started as an activist uh, when this beautiful lake that I grew up on started getting polluted and I started to realize how corrupt and you know, I, I'll say it racist and homophobic and uh, the local government was. Uh, and so even I spent about a year just trying to be an activist and save the lake from toxic algae blooms. And then I realized I had the time to run for mayor. And I, I realized how interesting it would be to run for a local office because I had a background in advertising. And when you run your own campaign at a local level, you have all these jobs. You essentially have to be a writer, writing your platform. You have to be a bit of an art director uh, and all these different jobs come into it. You have to send out mailers. You have to stay on message. You have to tell a story about who you are. Um, 
So it was something fun to do besides uh, screenwriting, which I was doing all the time. Um, and I'd be sitting in the local library uh, writing my screenplays while running my campaign and people would come up to me and say they're going to vote for me people would come up to me and say um you know f myself <laughs> <laughs> people's grandmas would drive down the street in their cars giving me the middle finger um grandmas other, yep um other people uh in big scary pickup trucks uh belching fumes from the tailpipe would stop next to me on the road and give me a thumbs up so I never really knew what I was going to get. Uh, and the day of the election was March 16th, 2021, um, which was the uh, the exact day that um, the movie I wrote uh, and produced, Watcher, uh, started shooting in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, and I lost the election, um, which essentially, as I put it, was kind of uh, a Larry David spite campaign. If you will, I was saying all the good stuff, like the stuff like the government shouldn't be corrupt and openly racist, and go and the mayor shouldn't go around town ripping down Black Lives Matters flyers, Black Lives Matter flyers, and screaming at people that they're illegal. Um, you know, so about 200 people in Skinny Alice thought that that was a good message. Uh, about 600 or 700 people in Skinny Alice wanted things to stay exactly like they were. Um, but it was an experience. I was fun. It was fun to do something uh, besides screenwriting while I was still still writing to kind of take my mind off and you know shake up my own world a little bit. Um, and the second I lost the election, I I got a uh, got the vax and moved out to Los Angeles. Are you glad you lost? I kind of in a way um you know it's like i i i didn't pull any punches you know i didn't i didn't try to win you know there's a way to try to win a political election and that's by telling people what they want to hear uh you know my opponent mary Sinnott, won by not having a debate and keeping silent and promising people that they'd have flat sidewalks and that the people in the community didn't have to change anything. My campaign was based around saying, hey, we all have to change our behavior to save our community. Uh, and people don't want to hear politicians saying, uh, we're all responsible and we all have to change. They want politicians who um, lie to them, say everything's okay, and that they don't have to do anything um, different than they're already doing. And so, yeah, I mean, Skinales is a very, lazy conservative backwards town i'm ashamed of my hometown uh and that's why i'm gonna that's going to change it i'm gonna go back this summer i uh, shake it up again um, i have lots of friends um who are people of color who are they don't go they live in syracuse they don't go to skinny atlas because people give them looks uh so i'm gonna keep being the government's worst nightmare there <laughs> which is kind of fun you know it is. In 2019, yeah. we had a town board um, that I didn't particularly like. It, it's not a secret. <laughs> like, I had to, I'm local, small town, and um, did a big, huge campaign and push to get three of my friends elected on the town board, and we won. And um, congratulations. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, kind of the locals taken back the town from the New Yorkers and um, it wasn't easy and we're going to lose it again. I mean, you know, whatever, but yeah. it's- Oh, wait, you won, you lost, you won. We won, Okay. but our people won, but I'm sure in the next cycle, they'll take it, the town back, you know, like, mm -hmm. and it, local politics are really interesting. And there's a lot of stories that happen on that local level that I think filmmakers, screenwriters, novelists, um, could clean a little inspiration from. <laughs> yeah, it's that's kind of what the country is. It's all these weird little mm -hmm. local towns with their own little weird local drama, and you can really learn a lot about people. Like I, I was going around people. People when I was ran for mayor, people are like, "What?" And then I started like suggesting it to like people who work in advertising who might like 
like to be creative, but might not like want to be like selling potato chips or whatever, move back to your hometown, like live like with your parents for a year or two. Why not um, get involved and, you know, try to like, try to change, um, try to change things at the, at the micro level. Uh, it's actually like a really, really interesting experience. You can do it. Like people, it doesn't occur to people yeah. can do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can. It's interesting. Yeah. It's kind of similar in like filmmaking where the studios are kind of the ones that don't want to change. They just want to regurgitate sequels and don't want to be original or creative. And here come the people who are for change and are like, let's mix it up. And they're like, no, 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 no. We don't want yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, people are very averse to, to change sometimes. So speaking of change, you, I don't even know if that has anything to do with change, but <laughs> um, you started writing scripts really young. I mean, like, and when I was reading your two articles, how many scripts have you written? I, um, I wanted to know the answer to that question. I, uh, so uh, a month or two ago, I, I sat down and I like thought back to when I was 12 years old or so. And I just try to remember the title of every script I'd ever written. Uh, and it's like somewhere around a hundred now, somewhere around a hundred, not that like, they're all so great, you know, like these are, oh, well, you're learning, but, um, yeah, like, but over like 20, 25 years, geez. Right. I bet you can, it is. And I bet you can write a feature really fast now. I can write them pretty fast. Uh, you know, I have the form down in my head. Uh, of course the form is changing now with TV and, mm -hmm. uh, what people want to see, um, episodically. Uh, but yeah, you know, <laughs> by now I'm pretty comfortable in the form so maybe but also now i, I got to change a little too i think uh think about tv and episodes is there anything that you wrote when you're younger that you're thinking you can bring back to current day zach it's <laughs> funny uh af after watcher i had its sundance thing and i people started to see it succeeding i got a i got a call um, from a guy who somehow I got his hands on a script that I wrote five years ago mm -hmm. uh, that he I might want to option, um, which I think would be cool because I could rewrite that. So uh, yeah, now that people have seen my name out there a little more, they're going through their archives and saying like, oh, hey, you sent us uh, this script five years ago or so. Uh, uh, how about, uh, you know, how about we throw you a little money for the option and we work on it and try to get this one going too. So that's been interesting. Yeah. I mean, you've got such a very interesting break-in story and we're going to put in the show notes a links to the two articles that you wrote for Script Magazine so people can go read them in your own words. But um, cool. I thoroughly enjoyed the story. And so can we just talk about this production company you had <laughs> and that the answering machine and your whole strategy behind that? Um, because like we are reckless and um, we're little balls of steel and love it when people have these stories where it's just like, okay, I, I gotta just make this happen. And I'm gonna do something totally crazy here, but what the fuck? Yeah, I, I remember, I mean, I'm sure if you link the article, um, it would be redundant to, to, to say the whole story, but- um, Well, some people don't yeah, read. I, <laughs> that's true. Um, that's true. Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, I think it was like 2012, 2013, uh, people weren't reading my scripts. Um, I'd had some credits, uh, I'd written a movie that hadn't done so well and I decided to, I'd had an agent. Uh, I was dumped by my agent. I'd, I'd been with Paradigm. I'd been with the CA at certain points. Uh, and I had credits. I knew my scripts were getting good because I was writing so much, but no one would take my calls. So I got an answering machine from Radio Shack. I uh, came up with a bogus name, Barbaric Media, which was easy to understand on the phone. And I started calling people as a manager and sending out my screenplays uh, under pen names. And everyone was taking my call. 
uh, I was like, people were reading, reading, and if they passed on a writer or a pen name two or three times, I uh, I would make up a new pen name. Uh, and I established rapports with like all the major companies in Hollywood. But I remember that day, I uh, when like you said, I knew something needed to happen, uh, and I remember like, you know, sometimes when you have a crazy idea, it seems so crazy, and you almost don't do it, and then after you do it it just makes such obvious sense and you can't believe you were ever questioning doing it in the first place. Uh, but I remember the day that I got the, the answering machine and I had a new script. I don't even remember what it was. And I was so eager to, to start this ruse, uh, but I had to go to Time Warner and I had to get the landline put in and I had to get the da 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 da. And it took, I remember it was also a weekend. So I remember I got the answering machine in my hands and it took about four or five days to actually get the landline established. And I was just like, I remember how long those those days were because I'd already like decided to do it. Uh, and I remember making that first call. I don't know who it was to, um, some producer who wouldn't take my calls. And it was so nerve wracking, but after a couple calls, I realized that it was working. You know, all I had to do was assume a, um, kind of an obnoxious managerial tone and they thought I was important and then everyone would read my scripts. Do you want to be Sadie's manager? Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's so interesting because I, I, I want to know more about your ad background, like being a, you know, what did you do in the ad space and how that helped you just kind of establish yourself as yourself as like that voice of being okay to go out there and put yourself out that way um hold on one second i'm on a podcast <laughs> all right you know how it is the second you start oh yeah everyone yep. is uh -huh. everyone. that's why i come to the shithole farmhouse to do my yeah. podcast because no one's yeah. here that sounds nice i just went it's... to lake arrowhead and spent a couple of days in the mountains i i, I want to get out too yeah <laughs> um yeah uh so advertising um i was a copywriter at gray worldwide for a year um that was the question right mm -hmm. my advertising and um i was this was like a little this was like about a year or two before i started barbaric and you know i needed money and i was kind of freaking out and i walked through uh, madison square park uh in uh manhattan and i was like what am i gonna do and i ran into this um uh this person i knew from high school on a complete lark and she was working at gray worldwide which is right there above italy uh on 23rd street and i uh was like i need a job like can you help me and she's like okay put together a portfolio um and funny enough i had no advertising background mm -hmm. so in my portfolio it was just like nothing to do with ads uh just maybe like writing i'd done and gray was looking for people at that time who were outside of the traditional advertising pool because they were restructuring their their creative um way they did things and they hired me i uh, as like a part-time and they gave me a desk uh and i was there for a year um, and i loved it for a few months uh but um you know, I, the ad life was not for me and I kind of checked out and I would just kind of be at my desk playing Pac-Man and writing like screenplays. Cause like, I couldn't do it. I remember like, it was just like, they're a huge company. So they would have meetings for the sake of meetings and there would be huge accounts where just like millions of dollars to burn. And you'd spend like six months and like 18 meetings to write like one tagline for like cheese or something. Um, so I did it for a year and learned a lot of stuff um, and had an experience of what the advertising industry is like. Uh, but that, uh, some of those lessons probably fed into me um, uh, probably uh, in my political campaign. Like as much as I didn't like it for certain reasons, uh, you know, getting an education and branding uh, probably led to my my barbaric idea and probably led to running a campaign. 
Yeah. Selling that cheese. That's Selling that cheese. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much cheese I sold uh, uh, or, or donuts or potato chips. I don't know. <laughs> are any of your, are any of your characters admin? Uh, yeah, it's, I, I have in several scripts, uh, I add people. Yeah. I, I, that world is such a interesting world. I, if, you know, sometimes I have characters that work in the ad world. Yeah. 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 So your mom was a screenwriter. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's what kind of catalyzed my interest in screenwriting. Uh, and um, it kind of comes full circle, actually. She was a finalist in the mid nineties in the Austin Heart of Film Festival. Uh, so we started establishing this family trip every year when I was uh, in middle school and high school, where we would go to Austin and we'd go to this film festival. Uh, said she had this screenplay uh, be a finalist there. Uh, and we did that for a lot of years and we would always take a family trip, uh, me and my mom and my dad to uh, this film festival. Uh, and it's it's kind of funny how things work out now because Watcher is uh, playing at South by Southwest uh, next month, which is in Austin, and uh, it's my mom and my dad are gonna gonna go, and uh, we all get to be in Austin like a decade later since we last were there That's taking so our family cool. vacation. Yeah. That's so cool. Does she does she have a regular day job? She uh, she actually uh, she continues to write. She's made some short films and. Uh, she teaches uh, screenwriting at Tompkins Cortland Community College, uh, which you probably know where that is in upstate yeah. New York near Ithaca. Yep. 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 I yep. went to Cornell. I know where that okay. is. So you know exactly where that is. Yep. Shout out to your mom. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to my mom. Shout yeah. out to my mom. We, we always like to give mom shout outs. You love mom. Have to give, have, yeah. Have we to give love her a shout moms. out. Have you met Sadie's mom? She's pretty badass. I haven't. Not yet. Not yet. yet. What it is. She yeah, going yeah. to South by Southwest? No, no. Okay. But uh, she's at a couple shows. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, sidebar you on some yeah, of. Yeah, tell me about your mom. Yeah. 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 We we'll have a whole. Yeah. We used to have a whole reckless creatives mom episode. Yeah. What? That's Just a great like, idea. Yeah. Cool. Have all like. Bring your mom on. Yeah. Bring your mom my, on. <laughs> yeah. The moms my mom will of do our, it. The moms of our guests. <laughs> yeah. The women who brought the guests into the world. That'll probably be the best episode, to be honest with you. I'd... Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Probably would be. My mother turns 90. Yeah, um would be the most on... into you and watch. Yeah. <laughs> she turns 90 on March 19th on the one year anniversary of Pipeline Artists. She turns wow. 90. Yep. Happy birthday to her. Yeah. And she's rocking. Awesome. She's, she still does taxes. She's driving around. She's at a client's house today. She's totally. Knock on wood, knock on wow. wood everywhere. She's totally there. independent there. She does taxes, you said. Yeah, yeah. She that's, now that's that's really impressive because oh, brain power. Yeah, I can barely. I don't even know how to do them. <laughs> I I told her she's never allowed to die because I don't know how to do my taxes without her. <laughs> no pressure. Oh <laughs> no pressure, mom. Oh I'm just gonna prop you up like weekend at Bernie's, and you're gonna just stay here forever. <laughs> do the taxes, yeah. Doing the yeah. taxes. <laughs> Doing the taxes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, taxes. I don't know. I, just, I don't know why I would choose to do it. But um, so let's talk about Watcher and um, getting that made. And also kind of interested in the concept that you live with your best friend as your manager and you live together still? Still, yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's a dynamic. Um, yeah, uh, what do you want to talk about first? Um, I don't care. Pick one. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So, I after my election, I didn't really know uh, where to go. Uh, my parents were in Key West. I thought I might pop down there, and uh, like you said, my best friend, who's now my manager and now my housemate. Uh, who interrupted uh, just a minute ago. I, he said, come out to LA and moved out to LA. He uh, was a, um, an assistant to celebrities uh, for a long time. 
And I'd always said, hey, you should, you know, be a manager. You have uh, really good people skills. Uh, you started a huge ultimate Frisbee game in Central Park. Um, uh, he and he was kind of reluctant, but he said, come out to LA and see how you like it. So I did, and I wasn't planning on staying. And we said, why don't we do a year, a year here? So we signed a, signed a lease on a house for a year. And I, he became my manager and uh, now we live together. And uh, we, uh, we manage, we manage, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of I want like dibs on like your life story, Zach. I think it's just, so cool. <laughs> it's, just it's just so much. <laughs> it's and it's pretty nice, you know. He it's like the first time I've had a rep who I, you know, I know what they're doing, uh, and we get to strategize, uh, and we get to really bounce ideas off each other, uh, and. Uh, you know, like when I write something, uh, he reads it and we talk about it. <laughs> That's some managers who didn't do that. Did uh, he answer and, your emails? <laughs> uh, we we work together. I mean, we have like we have the same, and we also are are writing partners too. Uh, we worked on some stuff together, so um, it's uh, it's been really great. Like we really like we really help each other and uh, have common goals and. Uh, it's definitely a unique uh, working situation, but uh, we're we're doing great. Like we're moving moving the needle on a lot of projects just because we get to focus uh, so like with such togetherness. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty confident, Sadie, that Zach's career path could not be replicated. No, by anyone else. I can't write this. It's <laughs> it's incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, and going back to Watcher, you know, like we we talked about in our interview for script, but you know, going from that that step by step of writing it, getting an option, to it getting you know shooting it the day you lose your election to Sundance premiere, uh, where I got to watch it with the movie. Like, if you guys haven't seen it yet, when it comes out, like, go and see it. I'm really excited to see it on the big screen at South by, because that's I think like that's where it deserves to be seen. But just kind of like talk about that process of just like, just even getting it out there to get options. Yeah, um, it was, you know, I've, I've optioned things before. Um, and it's always like, I always believe it when I see it. Um, and I optioned, you know, I wrote The Watcher, or it was called The Watcher. Now it's Watcher um, uh, in 2016. And I, I optioned it then to, to Kaplan Perone and I uh, there were three options so it, it was three years of you know one day looking at the calendar being like oh man the option's up and then they optioned it again and every iteration of the option they brought on people uh the director uh, Chloe Okuno was brought in on somewhere around maybe the second option between the second and third option uh we worked on some rewrites together uh and then it was uh, going to shoot and then COVID delayed it for a year. Uh, and I've been through this before with projects. It takes years and it's even for a script that is pretty straightforward. You know, there's no crazy locations needed. There's no like, dependency on like weather or special like snowstorms. There's no explosions. It's like, it's a very like makeable script and still it, it's like it takes many, many factors lining up to make it. Uh, and then I think it was shot in about 30 or 40 days. Uh, and then it was suddenly like, that's a very short time. You know, when you think about it being optioned for three to four years, then suddenly like, you know, it, it gets shot. And I wasn't on set because my political campaign. And uh, then suddenly it's an ending. And you're like, did that really, did that really happen? Like it's, you know, is it good? What happened? Uh, and then you wait. Uh, and I remember seeing a very, very rough cut a few months before Sundance. Uh, and finally, like, finally I knew it was, it was good. I was like, okay, they did a really, really good job. Uh, it, it became what it was supposed to become. Uh, but still like, it's still kind of anticlimactic. Like, again, I'll believe it when I see it on the big screen at South by, mm -hmm. you know, knock on wood that it'll happen. Because it's like, you know, I, I'm not having meetings. 
everything's on Zoom, right? I'm not going to the, you know, not like putting on the blazer and going to the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's bizarre. It's like, did anything really happen? Mm -hmm. You know, like I watched the movie on TV streaming um, and, uh, you know, it's like it's the same day to day. You know, I wake up, I don't go anywhere. Um, so it's like a lot has changed. Um, a lot's going well. Um, also, it seems like nothing's changed because it's kind of the same rhythm of the day, like as I'm sure as a lot of people know because of the, the pandemic and everything. But um, I'm looking forward to South by and seeing it on the screen and going, okay, like <laughs> finally, like the, a goal like five or six years in the making is kind of like come to finally come to fruition. And the people's reactions, you know, like <laughs> would love to talk to you after that, just as a little follow up of like, by the way, here's a little follow up. This is what Zach said, what it was like. <laughs> sure, you know? yeah, I I can't wait. Like we had a good screening here. We had like 10 or 10 people, 12 people over at the house to watch it streaming at Sundance. Mm -hmm. And the reactions were fun and people were like, oh, you know, it was, it was good. Like if it, if it wasn't good, I had what I was gonna say to you prepared, <laughs> but it was good. But still like you weren't sitting like, in the back of the theater watching strangers like react mm -hmm. to it uh which um is a uh, really exciting to think about but i'm really looking forward to and that's the interesting thing like a novelist doesn't sit there and watch someone read their book <laughs> as they fall sure. with it and it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure they I, I don't know what you i bet as a novelist you'd have to go to like new york city and like hang out on the subway <laughs> and like watch people reading your book you know yeah. Leave yeah. your book, leave Flip your book it. on yeah. the bench. Right. You know? yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> See if somebody picks it up, throws it in the garbage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or people read it and go, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the people who had been at your place watching the screening of Sundance were, had most of them read the script or not, were there people there who had no idea what the film was going to be? Um, they had a general idea of what it was going to be, but I, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I hadn't even really read the script in a long time. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the script is like somewhere on the laptop that I had before this laptop. Uh, so people were going in pretty, like pretty, pretty unaware of what it was about, except generally the genre mm -hmm. and generally the setup. Speaking of laptops, I loved what you said in the article about when your laptop fan went and you had to put your laptop on top of two ice packs to keep it <laughs> from oh, overheating. I, I for, kind of forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. That, was a, that was a time. That was a time. <laughs> Dedicated man. Yeah. I was it. on the top floor of the, the brownstone where all the heat went. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, <laughs> but it's kind of nice because as soon as the laptops melt, you can stop writing for a while. Yeah. As soon as ice packs melt. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you don't get too obsessed with writing. Oh, That's some dedication. It's good, there. Like, yeah, it's also a good way to like you know you're gonna sit down and yep. you're gonna write. And since it's melted, it's okay to walk away. You yep, did you your walk time. away. Yeah. Put them back in the freezer, go for a walk and yeah. start again. Exactly. Exactly. Um so What's what, what are you doing next? I have an idea of what you're doing next. And I'm I, there's one project I know that I'm like really excited for. Um, but like what's what's next for you as a writer, as a filmmaker after watcher? Um taking a lot of meetings, um, sending out a lot of uh scripts with Ben, um sending out scripts uh that I wrote during COVID, uh, a mountain climbing thriller, one about ultimate Frisbee, uh, one about a, a murderous chimpanzee, uh, and um, in, a, in a negotiation uh, for a rewrite with uh, Universal uh, Basilevs, uh, and writing, still pumping stuff out, like uh, still trying to like, try some new genres, um, was at the cafe writing a little earlier today, and just uh, kind of in a threshold period of knowing that the iron's hot and every day either doing one or the other either like trying to sell trying to send out scripts uh talking to agencies talking to producers or if you know i have a few hours trying to write the next one um 
kind of uh, busier than I've ever been. Uh, a little stressful because I want to make sure I capitalize on everything I can right now. Uh, but, you know, also like I pinched myself too. I say, hey, this is great. Like this is uh, also enjoy it too because this is what I was working for for a long time. Yeah. How how well, has how has becoming a sp- professional screenwriter like full time different than what you thought it would be, or is it um, what you thought it would be? It's actually you know, uh, it's it's this it's still the same. You know, not a lot has really changed. Like the success, like I had success with Watcher, but you know, I I still get up in the morning and I'm I'm like you know, holy shit, you know, I, I have to write another one. Uh, and it better be now it better be just as good or better. Um, so it's kind of like the same thing, but with a little more pressure. Uh, and um, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. I had another thought about, I forgot what I was going to say about that too. Um, That's okay. We're, we're, yeah. we're here. We're not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> With your your producing credit with Watcher, do you see a future for yourself doing more producing and more hands on producing yourself on your own stuff yeah. rather than stuff? Yeah, that's um that's my goal. Like um, and I think that goes hand in hand with advertising and um running a political campaign. You know, uh, producing is um, akin to to both of those things. Um, you know, organizing people for a common cause. Uh. I'd, I'd really like to step into that. Um, and I've been working with some uh, producers on other projects too and can hopefully co-produce with them. Uh, but I think it's like a natural progression, um, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, maybe even more so than than directing. Like you have to be a little crazy to to direct. I think you have to be less crazy to, you know, produce because you get to hang back in the shadows a little more. <laughs> you know? uh, so I think maybe... I'll, I'll work on producing a little more and kind of explore that, but always writing first, probably. Can you um, speak a little bit about how you got that producing credit, like how you were able to negotiate that? I negotiated it, yeah, during one of the option agreements. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I saw myself as a as a producer by, you know, hacking the system and getting the script read and moving it along in the first place. So I was like, yeah, you know, I'm a producer, you know, I, I got this to the people, I made it work, I sold it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, like, sometimes you, you know, you, you fake it till you make it a little bit, you, uh, you claim the title, then you grow into it, you claim the title, then you grow into it. Uh, no one really knows what they're doing, you know, uh, and that's like the biggest open secret in Hollywood, no one really knows how things work. So like you, you claim it and you, you grow into it and you just keep learning. So I almost kind of like dared myself to negotiate that, that title so that the next time I was established as a producer and then I can take on more responsibility on another project, um, you know, and learn more and grow more and have more input. Sort of like how, what Sadie and I did when we started this podcast, we had no idea what we were doing. No one knows what they're doing. (laughs) <laughs> no knows? yeah you just got to do it like oh how do we do a podcast oh let's i don't know let's just try yeah and yeah. we're doing it here it is here it is happening. yeah what a wild journey um and i think producing is pretty crazy once you start doing it more of it you're gonna realize you're also a crazy person <laughs> it's all it's yeah. all crazy everything about making movies is certifiably crazy (laughs) that's true that is true yeah i mean was there was there ever a point in this crazy journey that you thought what am i doing like what you know like what am i doing here like okay so advertising sucked well maybe there was something else i should try because this is crazy was there ever a point when you felt like i'm out man that was uh 2000 16 right before i wrote watcher actually i remember like walking in the west village in new york city i remember exactly where i i was uh it was night it was really cold uh and i like called my mom and i was just like what the fuck like 
I was working so hard and I was like, I had chosen writing from such a young age, but I was really angry. Like I was like writing so many screenplays. I had like done this like barbaric idea. People were reading my screenplays. People kept saying, this is a really good script, but it's not for us. Uh, and I'd try something else and it would be the same thing. And it almost seemed like I was like um, doing that Zeno paradox thing where you keep getting like halfway closer, halfway closer, but never getting there. And I remember this one day I just like had a breakdown. And this was like after two years of writing six scripts a year uh, with Barbaric. And I was like, I'm done. I'm like fucking done. Like, because it was like 20 years of my life, like writing screenplays. Yeah. Like for what? Uh, right. and like all the sacrifices of just like not like getting the job and forgetting it and like having savings and like you know like having or retirement just yeah just like <laughs> what uh, you know and then of course a week later I was like well I guess I'll write one more and then I was watcher and then boom there it is wow there's a, a young kid um a son of one of my friends who um just got a great job at Amtrak he's like early 20s and you know right out of college and and he's like very entrepreneurial very crafty handy he's a craftsman and but he's like hey if I take this job I can retire in my 50 my early 50s and then I could do whatever I want to do and you don't which I really that seems like if anybody's listening to this who's in their 20s they think 50s oh my god I might as well be dead like that's like forever <laughs> it goes fast kids <laughs> Let me just tell you right now, it goes fast. And if you don't have to worry about money and you have great benefits and you have all this stuff and then all of a sudden you're 50 and you're retired and you can do anything you want, you've got money coming in for doing nothing. And then you can just write, write, write. You're like, there's there's so, and I always think about the people who like you, like dove straight in and they're, you know, in their twenties and we're just in your teens and we're just so dedicated and so committed that at some point, like at what point do you say, oh my God, I have no 401k, I've got no retirement. Like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> you know? yeah, what like, the it's hell? It's so scary. I mean, the whole thing is so scary. And I'm always so impressed with people who just stuck it out and didn't take the practical route. You know, what did your parents say about that? Like, my parents would be like, get a job, girl. Uh, my parents were always just kind of like, you know, do it, do whatever you want. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe they should have been more like get a job, you know. <laughs> but it probably helped because your mother understood the passion for it. You yeah, know? my my parents are like both creative people, you know, so and they knew they knew I'd I'd chosen it and they were, you know, they're always really, really supportive. So that was always always really nice. You know, um, I never had to like explain it to them, uh, yeah. you know, or prove it to them, uh, which was really, uh, you know, like I didn't have to use bandwidth mm -hmm. to to have that stress. Uh, there was already enough stress of mm -hmm. going all in on it. Uh, so that was, you know, shout out to them again. Yeah. yeah. We, are, we yeah. are really liking your parents. Yeah. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> Good job, guys. Have them, have them on the show. <laughs> Yeah. Well. Sadie, Sadie, when you're in South by, are you going to get to meet them? Yes. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. you will be around. Okay. So I would like a little selfie a family group. Photo. Yes. Family photo with Sadie in there. <laughs> or just photo bomb it or something. Totally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could totally do that. Not a yeah. problem. Yeah. Cool. We'll get that. We'll get that photo. Yeah. yeah. I'd love that. That'd be great. We'd use it to pro to promote and advertise this episode. <laughs> cool. It all comes back to advertising. That's right. Totally. So have you, with these hundred scripts that you've written, have you written in like all the different genres? Like, is, or do you, like, have you written a whole bunch of other horror scripts? Uh, horror, yes. But I mean, like, it's funny, like, to see what pops up and what doesn't like 20 years ago i wrote one uh about a guy and his dog now there's this um channing tatum one like not that like they ever read the script that i wrote right but like 
I, I've written everything, like romantic comedies, uh, uh, everything. Um, and What's you know, your favorite? Was like, I, uh, saleable, and I had. I like a good drama. You know, I like a good comedic drama. That's what I'm working on now. Um, you know, like I, I. That's why. That's why I was really glad Watcher went forward because it is fun to write in genre, but uh, it like has a good story to tell. Uh, it has a good like societal story to tell. You know, it does something about the world and you know um, and believing women and it's like it's got like an aspect to it that shows what a good genre movie can do and like how powerful it can be um so like that's how i want to do thrillers that's how i want to do horror like you know um, and people like jordan peele do like a really good job with that too like here's this genre that's about you know it's really powerful how do you use it um mm -hmm. and it's to make it really powerful but uh uh, I would I would love to do a good like funny drama. And that's the uh, killing chimpan uh, chimpanzees, right? Murders chimpanzees. Well, one. Yeah. <laughs> who knows what'll ha who knows what'll <laughs> happen after a few rewrites? Yeah. Uh, but um, that's uh that one is a movie that I wrote something that I would want to probably see as a kid, you know. So, a big uh big murderous chimpanzee on a on a movie poster i buy a ticket yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so with all these scripts that you've written and the experiences that you had do you have any thoughts to the writers listening about taking notes and doing rewrites and what it's like when you look at um, your film and it's different than what you wrote <laughs> yeah i mean it's uh I think Chloe did a really good job. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's that's part of being a screenwriter. You know, you mm -hmm. wanna you wanna be is you wanna know who the characters are and what the story is, so that and all that has to be clear. So when it goes into production, uh, the actors and the uh, director can work with it. Uh, and you know, like there were things about Watcher that were different when I saw it, uh, but they were great, like they made it work. Um, I mean, you have to translate it, you know, from this page to physical action and noise. Like it's it's a translation process. And like, even if you're translating a book from one language to another, like you have to change it. It's something has to change. Some of the meaning changes. Uh, and I'm rewriting a script right now that I wrote a year ago that I'd forgotten that I'd even written. Uh, and I see all the errors that I made. And I think it's just a matter of like, I think I said this before on, on the other podcasts we did, it's just like being really fundamental and clear about who your characters are and what they want. And, you know, you know, don't like, especially these days with so much content, you gotta be really crystal clear and every scene should feel like it's moving the plot forward. Every scene should be like your character grappling but also doing things to mm -hmm. make sure and this is just like standard stuff like this is just standard screenwriting one-on-one -on -one stuff uh the way it's like the way it's gonna go wrong is like when you read your screenplay you think about it on the screen and you think about like sitting with your friends or an audience and if it's not getting to the point you know you just got to think about how awkward it is that it is when you're sitting there and people are kind of like looking at their phones like you got to make sure that like every line and every scene has like a dynamic to it where people want to like you know see the fireworks or see the conflict uh so yeah be as be as exacting as you can when you were doing that whole thing of pretending to be a manager to all these pen names and when you would get feedback from those managers like what what was like the biggest lesson you learned as a writer from the things that they were telling you? Um, people, uh, people don't really know what they want, <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> you know, like, cause I did it for five years and you know, at the beginning I had a Western and a werewolf movie and people were like, we don't do werewolves. We know the Westerns are, are, are done. And then by the time, like five years later, everyone was like, you know werewolf movies are popping up westerns are popping up uh it's 
I, it's just like, it always goes back to, to fundamentals and basics. Uh, you know, everyone's like all for the last couple of years, everyone was telling me, I, uh, all the agents I was talking to, all the producers were like, they're like, we're not going to do anything unless it's based on IP, existing IP. So don't, you know, that's all we're doing. And that changed overnight yesterday, like two days ago, I was talking to an agent and he was like, we need original ideas. Like IP is like out now. Like, cause everyone's like juiced all the stuff they can do out of existing IP at this point. So, you know, I think like the ingredient, the ingredient is time, like keep, you know, honing on your craft, keep telling like the stories where you back to the fundamentals of screenwriting and you need some luck and some time uh, for, you know, the industry to like catch up with you or get behind you too. Uh, Cause it's, you've got to hit the right thing at the right time. So you just have to kind of like, you know, like find some Zen and detach and just keep writing scripts that you care about that are well-written and keep writing them and keep sending them out. And sooner or later, that'll align with like a little bit of luck. I'm imagining all these writers out there starting to make phone calls, pretending to be managers. <laughs> 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 and they're going to have like a zillion, you know, calls coming in from like, what agency is this? Like, what management is this? What media company is this? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Whatever. Yep. It's okay. Hey, you know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah i mean it's also sometimes... fun it's a fun like character development exercise too right you get to make mm -hmm. up all these new writers and like who you wish you were and <laughs> yeah yeah and make up stories about them why yeah. they couldn't take meetings and also the personality of the manager who i was which was kind of liberating to like you know like uh all these producers who would read my work i got to like be brusque with them on the telephone which was kind of cathartic yeah i'm sure <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome i don't i don't have much else i mean obviously i'll see you in a couple of weeks and i'll bug you then but yeah i mean can't wait if I see can it you, you know read the articles read all the interviews watch the movie i mean there's so much to like learn from from you and your journey one thing i want to ask you though before we go if you could go back in time and tell that 12 year old kid who was like, oh, I want to be a writer. If you could tell him, give him some advice, um, knowing what you know now, what would you tell him? Uh, I would tell him not to be so obsessed with it. I, I think there was years where I was, you know, putting all my eggs in one basket, which who's to say that's not why I got Watcher to where it is mm -hmm. now, but you know, there's like, there's something to like relaxing about it and living your life too. Um, like I think there's years where I was just obsessed with writing and like the more rejection I got, the more uh, determined I got and the more I like isolated myself and wrote harder and wrote more. Uh, but there's an element of like, your your own attitude coming through in a script i think it was when like you know i relaxed and was living my life a little more that things were going to happen when they were going to happen uh and like the more uh you know the, the easier you are on yourself and the more you go out and give yourself a break and have a nice day uh the more you're going to want to write and the better your writing is going to be and like the more fun it's going to be if you didn't have a fun time writing it uh, it's going to come through when people read it. You know, if you forced yourself to write it and make it perfect and there's stress in your attitude when you're writing it, people are going to feel it. Like the scripts that I've always uh, had success with are scripts that I had fun when I was writing them. Uh, you can feel it when you read it. So that would be my advice. Like be, uh, you know, work hard, but be easy on yourself. Well, I can't wait to wear a vote for Zach Ford t-shirt 2025 <laughs> 2025 i am all over it i'll have to like i can actually drive to scanny atlas and i can just oh. walk all around wearing the t-shirt cool we'll uh we'll get in some good trouble we'll, we'll do some protests oh thousand percent i'm there okay. i'm totally there okay. i'm a rebel rouser okay good <laughs> 
and reckless. <laughs> Thank cool. you, Zach. Right. Thanks, guys. I really had a, a good time. Thanks for having me on. Good, yeah. good. We appreciate it very much. Yeah. Reckless Creatives is a Pipeline Artist original podcast. Like, subscribe, and follow us on social media at Pipeline Artists. And find more info at pipelineartists.com slash listen. Until next time, stay reckless.